Hello, I'm Simon Whistler, you're watching the Today I Found Our YouTube channel, and in the video today we're looking at 10 video game facts that you probably didn't know. Number 1. The game Pac-Man was inspired by pizza. You see, back in 1979, 27-year-old Namco employee Toru Iwatami claims that he was staring at a humble pizza when he had an idea for a video game that centered around eating. What inspired him? The pie was missing two slices and thus resembled a mouth. What resulted was Pacu-Man, a name that was a derivative of the Japanese phrase Paku Paku Taberu. This is an onomatopoeic slang term that is used to describe the sound that a mouth makes when it's opened widely and then closed again in close succession. In short, exactly what the Pac-Man character does to eat up his delicious dots. Speaking of eating, the inspiration behind Pac-Man consuming food to gain power was reportedly inspired by Popeye. Number 2. The gun in the original Duck Hunt primarily just consists of a button, the trigger, and a photodiode light sensor. When you pull the trigger, this causes the game to make the TV screen go completely black for one frame. At this point, the game uses the light sensor to sample the black color it's reading from your TV to give it a reference point. This is essential given that the ambient light in a particular room and other things of this nature can vary greatly. In the next frame, the game causes the target area to turn white, with the rest remaining black. If the game detects a shift from black to white from the gun's photodiode in that split second, it knows you are aiming correctly at the target, and so doesn't specifically need to know anything about where on the screen the target is. For games with multiple targets at any given time, the same type of method is used except multiple target frames are shown. So the game will flash the black reference screen, then will flash one of the targets, leaving the rest of the screen black. Then it flashes the next target, again leaving the rest of the screen black, and so on. The game knows which target is hit, if any, by which frame is currently being shown when a light shift is detected. Interestingly, if you read over the patterns for the NES Zapper Gun, one of the main features they point out which separates their gun from the previously patented light detecting guns is that in the preferred embodiment of their system it has the ability to distinguish between multiple targets in one frame however that's not actually what they did in the NES system rather they used multiple frames one per target as previously described in a one frame system it uses a signal from the TV itself this signal is in the form of pulses, which signify the start of the horizontal and vertical retracing. The computer hooked up to the TV can use these pulses to more or less tell what area is currently being traced on the TV. It can then time this with a shift in light detected by the photodiode. Thus, with precise enough timing, it is able to detect which target is being hit in just one frame. With this method, the flash can happen fast enough that it's nearly imperceptible to most people, unlike in the actual NES system, where when multiple targets are shown, most people can perceive the flash. The NES system did use the vertical retrace signal to be able to detect the start of each frame, though, but it didn't use it to detect anything about the position of the target, as in the preferred embodiment described in the patent. Number 3. The rights to Tetris were originally owned by the Soviet Union. The game was created by Alexei Leonidovich Payitnov with the assistance of Dmitry Pavlovsky and Vadim Gerasimov, who ported it to an IBM PC, and it was released on June 6, 1984. At the time, Payetnov was working at the Dorodnitsim Computing Center, which was part of a Soviet government-funded research center in Moscow called the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Because Payetnov was working for the government and was using their equipment when he created Tetris, they retained the rights to the game in the beginning with no royalties being paid to Payetnov. After the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, Payetnov moved to the United States, but the Russian government still maintained licensing rights to Tetris. Finally, in 1996, the game rights were passed to Payetnov, who was at the time working at Microsoft from 1996 to 2005. Payetnov then set up the Tetris company with Hank Rogers as his business partner, finally receiving royalties for the game he'd created 12 years before. Number 4. The name Nintendo comes from the Japanese name Nintendo. Roughly translated, Nin means entrusted and Tendo means heaven. So basically, leave luck to heaven. If this seems strange for a name or slogan for a company, perhaps it's important to note that it started out as a playing card making company in 1889. 
Number 5. In video games such as Batman Vengeance, The Adventures of Batman and Robin, Batman Arkham Asylum, and Batman Arkham Knight, among many others, you can hear Luke Skywalker. Well, at least the actor who played Luke Skywalker. You see, Mark Hamill has played the character of the Joker in various mediums such as cartoons and video games longer than any other actor, starting with the 1992 Batman the Animated Series all the way to today, including in the upcoming Batman The Killing Joke set to be released in 2016. Incidentally, perhaps this is a good place to mention my favorite Mark Hamill quote of all time. I've been married to a dental hygienist for years, and if you think I haven't heard, use the floss, you'd be mistaken. He married dental hygienist Mary Lou York in 1978. They are still married and have three children. Number 6. According to Nolan Bushnell, Atari was named after a term in the game Go. In that game, when you are about to capture another player's piece, you say Atari, which is somewhat equivalent to check in chess. The word is derived from the normalized form of the Japanese word Ataru, meaning to hit the target. Number 7. Pong was originally meant only as a training exercise for a new gaming developer at Atari, Alan Alcorn, and wasn't originally intended to be released as a consumer product. When Alcorn was hired by Atari in 1972, Nolan Bushnell, who founded Atari along with Ted Dabney, told Alcorn that he had recently signed a contract with GE for Atari to create a very simple electronic table tennis game. In fact, there was no such contract, and Bushnell just wanted to give Alcorn something very easy to develop, as Alcorn had no experience with video game design and development, though he did have a background in computer science and electrical engineering. Within the initial set of stipulations for the game that he was given, Alcorn found it quite boring, so decided to spruce it up a bit by making the ball bounce off the paddle at different angles, depending on what segment of the paddle was hit. He also had the ball move at a progressively faster rate after each successful return. By a happy accident of a defective circuit, the game also featured a space at the top of the screen which was unreachable by the paddles, and which Alcorn felt made the game more fun, as skilled players could try to aim for that spot. Despite the fact that it was initially meant as a training exercise, Bushnell and Dabley were impressed with what Alcorn had come up with in the few months he had been working on the project. While still pessimistic about its marketability, they decided to try out the prototype at a local bar, Andy Capp's Tavern, to see how it did. If it did well, they figured they'd try to sell it to Bally Manufacturing or Midway Manufacturing, two companies they had contracts for other games with. Both Bally and Midway were interested initially in the game, however, within about a week of the test run, the game started malfunctioning and Alcorn was sent out to fix it. What he found was that the game was malfunctioning because the milk carton used to collect the coins had overflowed, and eventually some of the coins began causing shorts in the coin operating circuitry. At this point, Bushnell backtracked on his offer to sell the game and decided to have Atari manufacture it. To do so, he convinced Bally that Midway didn't think the game had any potential. Then he convinced Midway that Bally also thought the game had no potential. When the two competitors heard this, they both withdrew, leaving Bushnell free to do business with them later while still retaining the rights to Pong. After funding and then manufacturing difficulties, Pong as an arcade-style game was finally released and it was wildly successful, earning an unprecedented $35 to $45 per day per machine. An even bigger step forward for it, though, was when Atari released a home version of Pong, originally through Sears Sporting Goods, under Sears Telegames brand name. The home version sold 150,000 units the first Christmas it was released. From that and subsequent sales, this simple training exercise became the first ever commercially successful game, spurring the video game boom that followed. Number 8. The name Zelda in The Legend of Zelda was derived from Zelda Fitzgerald. This Zelda was quite the remarkable woman in her own right. Beyond being the wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald, she herself was a novelist, and was popularly dubbed the first flapper. Her father's position as the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court protected her somewhat, but also got her into the news quite a bit when she was young for her unladylike antics, such as wearing a skin-tight, flesh-colored bathing suit so it would be reported that she swam in the nude. As a sort of snapshot into her philosophy on life, it was essentially girls just want to have fun, but literally, according to her high school graduation photo was, why should life be all work when we can all borrow? Let's only think of today and not worry about tomorrow. That was pretty much her life in a nutshell, only she never really needed to do the borrowing part. 
But what about Link in the game? Well, his depiction was inspired by Peter Pan, the only other green-clad boy that seems to never grow up. Shigeru Miyamoto said he wanted his protagonist to be recognizable, and what better way to do that than to use a similar depiction to arguably the most well-known boy in children's entertainment. As for the name, that came from the series taking place in the past, present, and in the future, with the main character being the link between them. Number 9. There are two Zelda games from the late 90s that many fans are unlikely to have ever played. This is because they were only released as broadcast satellite games over a short period of time. Their titles were The Legend of Zelda The Ancient Stone Tablets and The Legend of Zelda Triforce of the Gods. The good news is that there are apparently pirated ROMs for these two games in existence. Not that I would ever encourage that kind of thing. Number 10. In the early going, the brass at Nintendo weren't too happy with the approach for the gameplay of Zelda, where players more or less simply explore without much in the way of real hints as to what they're supposed to be doing other than assemble the Triforce. And indeed, test groups who played the initial game tended to get confused as to what to do. Shigeru Miyamoto argued, and did eventually convince the executives, that the game's underlying premise of just exploring and seeing what there was to see in the world created didn't need to be changed. Turns out, he was right. Miyamoto himself has stated that his primary inspiration for the character and the game flow was derived from his explorations of the hillsides surrounding his childhood town of Sanobi, Japan. As he said, when I was a child, I went hiking and found a lake. It was quite a surprise for me to stumble upon it. When I traveled around the country without a map trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. Yet another memorable moment of adventure for Miyamoto was when he discovered a cave entrance and explored its interior with the aid of a single lantern. There presumably wasn't an old man inside handing out wooden swords. So I really hope you like those video game facts. If you did, please give us a like below. It really helps us out. And also, subscribe to our channel. We put out brand new stuff just like this every single day. Also, if you like this video, you'll probably like some other videos that are related to this, which I'm going to link to on the screen now. And so just click on those to check them out. And thanks for watching.